morning. Welcome to Longmont. Welcome to another day out in the street. Longmont is the fourth, fourth Friday of each month. Uh, I'm here in Longmont, been over, coming here for over four years. Last couple of Fridays, I've not been able to be here, and uh, I've missed some trips uh, since October when I came out of Trinidad. Uh, there've been I've been suffering from a lot of uh, physical uh, depletion, physical strength, just suffering. I don't know where it's coming from, but the fatigue. And then uh, here in January, I started a long-term fast. That is also uh, weighing on me, and um, probably. Uh, Long term being 75 days, somewhere around 45 days, something like that. I don't know. I've lost track of the number of days. I just know it goes to April 11th, and April 11th will be day 75. So uh, if you haven't seen a, a sermon here or there, or you haven't seen me at a corner there this time or that time or whatever, uh, it's because I've not been able to. Uh, yesterday, such as Thursday, yesterday, Thursday, I didn't go to Louisville. I just couldn't make it. I, after the class, I just collapsed under exhaustion. And I just needed a day off. And the Lord uh, always allows me to stay home or rest. I work in the ministry at home. I spent many hours, probably four or five hours, working in the ministry yesterday. Maybe even six, I don't know. But uh, uh, He lets me stay home. One of the challenges is, uh, and I think Wednesday too, I didn't go out either. But Wednesday wasn't so much on uh, Wednesday. I was supposed to at Boulder High School in the afternoon. I went there in the morning to pray, but in the afternoon I was supposed to go there also. However, and I think I might have mentioned this in class, I'm not sure, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, I am personally, uh, now you can think about it any way you want, but this is being honest and being transparent. Uh, I am scared of high school students, high school boys basically. Uh, and I'm not so much scared of them, but I'm more scared of what I would do if they confronted me. Because they're minors, they're under 18. And uh, they have big bodies, they have adult sized bodies, but they're children inside. So they're little children, little boys, little girls inside, great big bodies. And so because of that, they're emotional system is all over the place and they're unpredictable uh, junior high and elementary no problem college no problem but high school and uh, I've been going to Boulder High School now for four years and every time it's been a struggle I've skipped many many afternoons because of fear of the call of the high school students now that may seem kind of odd you can always say well get a life John or whatever but it's not so much like I said it's not so much of them being scared of them but what happens if they attack me what happens if they you know because they always come in gangs there's never just one at a time there's always four five six seven eight of them and in a gang there's always one who wants to pretend and become like uh, he, he's the big dog he's the top dog of the group and he wants to prove it and uh, so in that proving he's some big kingpin in their group, their king, their group, whatever you want to call it, their friends, uh, they, he'll do something that he would normally not do. And that's happened to me many, 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 many times at Boulder High School. And, uh, and so, fortunately, the Lord has kept me, but since there's no one that comes with me to Boulder High School in the afternoon, if somebody would come with me when I go to Boulder High School, I can go because I would be able to lean on my, my friend who would be with me. But so far, I've been asking for four years for somebody to come with me to Boulder High School, and so far, nobody has said, yes, I'll come with you. So that tells me a lot, but that's during the lunch hour. I mean, I'll only go for an hour. If you only have an hour, I'll go out with an hour. But so far, nobody has elected to come out with me to Boulder High School. And uh, so what, I'm gonna, what I decided to do on Wednesday in prayer, not on my own, never anything on my own, never do anything on my own. I always counsel with the Lord uh, by His Spirit. So I counsel with the Holy Ghost. And so what we're going to do uh, for the rest of the school year is I'm not going to attend that uh, ministry at 15th and Arapaho. 
uh, and I'm gonna replace it with going to Erie, Colorado. And then, but when school is let out, I'll go back to Boulder High School at my normal location, which is one block up from that, or a couple blocks up from that, on the corner of the high school uh, at 17th and Arapaho. And I'll be there all summer long uh, on, on my schedule. Yeah. I'll be there on my schedule. So, uh, but once school lets up, I won't go back until the next year unless somebody comes with me. So that's the way that's gonna happen. And uh, I'll change my schedule around a little bit to uh, set up my Erie location sometime during April or maybe the first of May for that new city that I'm gonna bring in uh, by the Holy Ghost. I've been praying for Erie for over two years, probably three years. Yeah, probably three years I've been praying for Erie, Colorado, which is about, I don't know, 40 minutes on the bus. On the bus. Driving's probably a lot faster, but I ride the bus. So that's just kind of an overview of a couple things that I'm doing. But today, God wanted me to Longmont and uh, got the class done at 8 o'clock. Immediately got started getting ready to go to work today and was able to get out of the house by 9.15, catch the 9.37, got here on time, and I'll uh, be here till 3 o'clock and I'll catch the bus back. So right now, we're at 5th and Main. This is 5th Street right behind me here. And this is Main Street, which is actually US 287, 287, US 287. And it goes from Wyoming border all the way down south, kind of curves after Denver, kind of curves and goes towards Texas. I think it's an old cattle route. That's what I'm thinking, old cattle route about in the 1800s because it goes right into Dodge City and uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of herds would be go down this way. Okay. Still shouting, brother. Yeah, God bless you. Let me try to do some of this. I don't know what it is. The last couple of days, my beard is getting out of hand. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I don't cut any of this out. I just, I just do one take and I just take care of it. All right. Let's pray. So, Lord, I thank you that we can come out to the street where you tell us to go. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us a plan to follow, a purpose, what to do. And you've given us a message, a word in our heart that we can deliver on the street, on the channel, uh, in a sermon, and also a message on our banner. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the Bible, the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, that you've trained us up in your Word so that we can deliver the Word of God uh, the way you want us to deliver it. And we glorify you, Father, and we thank you, Jesus, by your power. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So after I, I'll be here for a few hours, and then I'll walk all the way down to uh, uh, Highway 119 and 287. That's Ken Pratt. And there's some trees, that pine trees. I, I, you've seen several videos of me standing there. And uh, But it's a long walk, and it's too hard to catch the bus to go right down there. So it's probably about a you know, 30, 35-minute walk, pretty good pace to get down there. But... The Lord had me come up here first because that place is downhill. <laughs> and it's just easier for me to get that way. So this will be the first time I'm starting here. But this is where I started every time. But I just opened up the second location in Longmont later on, earlier, earlier in the year. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to go over to uh, Proverbs chapter 22 where I did my scripture short for the day. Proverbs 22, and I did not, I thought I was going to overdress, but I did not overdress because that wind, that's, there's a breeze blowing, it's very, very icy cold. My hands are literally ice cubes. It might look nice and warm, but it's not warm at all. I got probably four layers on top and uh, three layers on the bottom, and I'm still cold. And I didn't, I just brought a neck warmer, and I, had, I didn't even bring my hat, so, oh well. So in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4, that's where I started the scripture short for the day. Uh, chapter 22 in Proverbs, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. One more time. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Humility and fear. So humility is a condition of the heart, the heart. God looks at our heart and the fear of the Lord fear is that what it says fear of the Lord yeah the fear of God fear of the fear of God so the reason that wisdom 
is in, well, the reason Proverbs talks about fear so much is because the fear of the Lord is the beginning to wisdom. Now we have two wisdoms. We have the wisdom of heaven, and then we have the wisdom of this earth, the world, worldly wisdom. And people get rich, they, they do these things. They, have, they get rich, they get honor, but they don't get life. They don't get life. So the wisdom of this world will shortchange you. It'll actually give you death. It'll give you riches. You can live in a big fancy home. You can be a multimillionaire. You can become a billionaire in America. And uh, you can have honor. Because once you get that kind of money and that kind of prestige, uh, you, people will honor you at all kinds of events. You'll be very, very important. Honor could be the other word for important. But the unfortunate thing with that, even though you've touched a lot of people and you've been very successful in life, if you've lived and operated in the wisdom of the world, which is a new age, which is a success motivation, which is Andrew Carnegie and Napoleon Hill, all that is worldly wisdom. Think and Grow Rich, you read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and you're gonna suffer. Not today, and maybe not the whole your whole life, because there are more millionaires that have come out of the book, Think and Grow Rich, by Napoleon Hill than any other book in the world. There's no other book in the world, other than the Bible, that has produced more millionaires than Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. But that is worldly wisdom, and we know that worldly wisdom comes from Satan. And you can read, you can see Satan if you know what you're looking for. You can see it from cover to cover, all throughout Think and Grow Rich. Now I know a lot about Think and Grow Rich because back in the early 80s, uh, probably from 78 to about 82 or 83, I taught success motivation. And I read hundreds of success books, and I read Think and Grow Rich probably about a dozen times. In fact, I went through many paperback books. In fact, one time I actually cut it apart and built a binder with it. And I would build my teaching out of Think and Grow Rich and several other books. That was before I went to Bible school. And the Lord delivered me from that. But I didn't know because I saw other preachers and other pastors teaching success. I saw Oral Roberts teaching from Think and Grow Rich way back in the late 70s. You know, of course he came out of that. But one of his slogans came out of Think and Grow Rich. Whatever a mind, whatever, let's see, I'm not going to say that. But, uh, and so I did the same thing that uh, people I looked up to. I'm a preacher, I'm a minister, so when people that are very important and big and high in the ministry world, they're doing it, I think, why can't I do it? Because I was stupid at that time. I'm, I'm not stupid anymore, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> but I meet Christians every day who are stupid, but they won't listen to me. I tell them something, they go, forget that, dude. I'm going to do what I want to do because I know more than you do. I get that every day. I get that in church. I get that on the street. People don't want to listen to somebody who's smart in the Lord because they think they're smarter. What does that say? It says right here, by humility. That doesn't seem very humble to me. But uh, now remember, I'm talking and giving an example. So just because I may come across not being humble, I am. And I say that all the time. I'm just a nobody. I'm just a. I'm just like you. I'm just a truck driver turned preacher, street preacher. All right. But by humility and the fear of the Lord. So not by bowing your knee to the world, and bowing your knee to the God of this world and some corporate structure or some professor in some college, bowing your knee to them so you get a grade, so you can graduate, so you can get money. Because that's the only reason you're going to college, is to get money. That's it. There's no other reason. I don't care what you, they tell me or what somebody tells me. The reason you're going to college is to make more money. Now, is that bad? No, that's not bad. I mean, I'm not putting it down. I mean, I tried college five times. I wish I would have been a college graduate. I would have, I would have loved it. It would have made me feel good. In my flesh. Wouldn't have helped my spirit at all. At all. Might, be, might, have, might have hurt it. Maybe that's why God wouldn't let me finish college. It just wouldn't let me do it. That's why I went trucking. Went trucking at 23 years old. Everybody got out of college and went into their chosen profession. 
I graduate as a flunker, as a flunky, flunky. I just, I mean, I flunked every class, every semester I flunked. After five times, I just gave up and bought myself a truck and went trucking, man, 23 years old, owner operator. And uh, stayed out there till I was 63, 40 years. So by humility and the, so it says right here in Proverbs 22, verse 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord. So fear of the Lord is not outside, it's inside. And it's not some awe and respect. It is you're scared of God. And if you remember a couple days ago, I preached on a, on a scripture short about uh, being a sluggard. I have a lot of fear of God. And oftentimes, sometimes I feel like I'm a sluggard. And that kind of sometimes kind of pushes me forward to keep moving. But God has been helping me a lot lately. I hope you can say the same thing that God's been helping you. Because God's been helping me a lot. And, and so, how do, I, how, do you, how do you bring in that humility, a humble heart? You have to pray and read the Word, study the Word, and see the verses that talk about humility. See the verses that say you're nothing but a, a lump of clay. See the verses that say you're a vessel. See the verses that say you're to empty, you know, you're to empty yourself out, sort of like, you know, there's going to be an empty vessel filled with God. And, to, and other verses that say, no, you're not to be high-minded. Other verses that say, you, you know, that you don't bring God down. Uh, you don't try to exalt yourself. There's a lot of verses in the Bible that can teach you how to be humble. And one thing that I do is I just always tell people and tell, just say all the time, that nobody, man. I'm really, I am nobody. I'm just another guy out in the field working for God. I'm just doing something a little different than other people are doing. But I'm really, truly, I don't feel like I'm anybody. I feel like I'm just a dot on a pebble. I just, I feel like nothing. Now, when I say that and talk that way, I'm not talking about, I'm not belittling my Christianity. I'm not belittling Christ within me. I'm not demoting Him. Because when I talk that way around Christians, they tell me, oh, John, you're somebody. You're a preacher. You're a man of God. You're this and there that. See, because they don't get it. They think when I talk this way about being nobody, they think and they look at me and hear me from the ears and their eyes of their flesh. Because the world teaches, that, teaches you that you are somebody. You're great. You're mighty. You're wonderful. You're this and you're that. Stand up on your own two feet and take a bull by the horns and all that kind of stuff. Go, 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 right? You can do it, right? That's what they say, right? If I can do it, you can do it. Do it, do it, do it. You can do it, man. Go after it, you know? Observe the masses and do the opposite. There's all kinds of catchphrases in the world and in the flesh that people like and they use it and they put it into their Christian religion. They put it into their church and they put it into their ministry. And it's taken me years and years and years and probably a decade or two to get all that worldliness out of me. Yeah. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, I never would have said I'm nobody. Not in a million years. Because I felt like I was important. I felt like I was somebody special, somebody very important. And I walked that way too. I had beautiful suits that I wore and I looked good. I looked like I was somebody very important. When I walked into a restaurant, people noticed that I walked into that restaurant. I walked in like I owned the place back in the 70s and the early 80s because that's what I taught. I taught success motivation. And I've been through a lot of courses and a lot of classes and a lot of seminars and I read, like I said, probably over 300 books on the, on the topic of success motivation. And I bowed my knee to that God until I went to Bible school, like I said. And then everything began to change dramatically. But I've got all that, I don't even talk that way anymore. Never even mention it. But I hear Christians still talk that way today. <laughs> oh well. So back to the verse here. It says here in 22 verse 4, By humility and the fear of the Lord. 
So by humility and the fear of the Lord, I have gained riches. Have I gained worldly riches? No, no, not really. Am I taken care of? Yes. Am I in debt? No. Do I have money in the bank? Yes. Does, my, does our church, our ministry have money in the bank? Yeah. Is the church in debt? Is it borrowed a bunch of money? No, we're debt free. So we're a debt free church, debt free ministry, and we got money in the bank. If God wants to go do some, God has already provided the money so we can go do it. If God asked me to do something yesterday, he asked me to do something, and so I pulled the money out of the account and did what he wanted me to do with that money. I'm not broke. I don't have to count my pennies. I'm not suffering. But understand when I say that, understand when I say that, listen, I live very, very frugal. I watch every penny, nickel, dime, quarter, every dollar, and I weigh everything trying to make my money stretch because I'm in retirement now and I'm not going to go get another job to supplement my retirement. And uh, so I've had to lower my lifestyle way, 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 way down. Huh way down <laughs> you know way down and so now you know I don't live in some big custom home anymore don't have two cars and a boat and pool in the backyard and all kinds of fancy stuff and vacations and all I don't live that way anymore I don't live like a rich man <laughs> even though I wasn't that rich but it looked like I was but I wasn't in debt I haven't been in debt since Bible school the Lord taught us to get out of debt so we got out of debt because I was in big time debt. Drove a Mercedes, had a Cadillac, big, nice, beautiful, brand new home. But it was all mortgage to the hill. I was paying the payments. I was paying the payments, but I was in debt. And so the Lord talked to us about that. By the time I finished Bible school in 1989, uh, we were completely out of debt. Even our truck, we had our own truck at that time, even our truck was out of debt. Everything was, we were debt free when we moved from Tulsa to Redding, California. We had no debt. And, but we've had to lower, or I've had to lower my lifestyle. So nowadays, I live in a studio apartment. Studio, one room and a bathroom, one room. You say, oh, how could you live in a studio apartment? You lived in this big, beautiful home. Two living rooms, a den, and all this stuff. And, all, you know, yeah, well, what about that? Well, you have to make a choice. Do you gonna, are you going to live your life for building your own estate, building your own kingdom? Or are you going to give up your life and die daily and serve Almighty God and build God's kingdom? That's what I decided to do way back, way back when, <laughs> a long time ago. And it, had, it didn't happen overnight. It's taken me a long time. And of course, a long time ago started, you know, a long, long time ago. But I have developed humility. And you have to humble yourself because now I call my, my home that I live in, my little studio apartment, I can't even afford a one bedroom apartment because I'd rather take that money and give it to the church, to the ministry, to the Lord. Not to me, I don't need, what do I need an extra bedroom for? I'm only one person now. My children are growing up, my wife is not doing what she does, and uh, you know we're not legally married anymore. That happened in 94, that's the greatest tragedy in my life. But I'm never remarried, she's never remarried. So that could be an excuse why you don't want to follow me. <laughs> and. Uh, and so I've been breaking my lifestyle down, and now I even gave away my car about six, seven years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, the summer of 17, I gave my car away. And uh, then, then the guy I gave it to said, no, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to give you some money. So that was kind of nice. That was unexpected, but it's for the ministry. And so now I ride a bicycle, and I walk, and I ride the city bus. You know, one time... You know, I had my choice of cars, and, and we, you know, did, went sailing, had a nice sailboat, and uh, sailed on a beautiful lake, and, you know, beautiful home, and big backyard with, oh, it's just absolutely breathtaking, very custom home. It's the only home like it, and all of Reading is a custom-built, custom-designed home. 
and it was old, yeah, but it was still beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Ponds and pools and lakes and gardens, and it was just absolutely breathtaking. I would lay in the pool, look up at our pine trees, and just say, Nancy, I feel like I live on vacation. I feel like I live at a resort. I'd float around the pool with my kids, and I just said, man, isn't this the life? It was wonderful, wonderful. And, uh, but I was still living as a prideful person, prideful person. And if you don't humble yourself, yourself, you don't humble yourself, God's going to humble you because he has a, something he wants you to do. And so I tried humbling myself. I tried. I mean, I really earnestly tried humbling myself for years and years and years and years, probably over five years of working on trying to humble myself. And I couldn't do it. I, I, I couldn't do it. I tried humbling myself, but I had so much, so much pride inside of me. Because you have to understand, I started my life when I was 16 years old. That's when I moved out of the house. I was basically thrown out of the house. And I had to grow up really fast. I still had two years of high school left. I was in my junior year. And I had to grow up really fast. And I made it. I made it. And that built a lot of false pride inside of me. False pride. Because I beat my dad at his own game. And I beat my mom at her own game. And I became a success. And uh, at my level, you know, don't, don't paint some big picture, okay? Because success is different for a lot of people. But I would classify myself as successful at my level, at the low level that I was at. My brother was a much higher level, and he was successful. My sister, which is six years younger than me, brother's two years younger, my sister's six years younger, and she too was very successful at her level, which is also was higher than mine. But all three of us were very successful, and we really outwon our parents, because all three of us are real similar and totally completely different than our mom and our dad. And all three of us couldn't wait to get out of the house. Couldn't wait to get out. And so all of us left really early in our childhood because of our horrible upbringing. But we all became successful. And so because of that, I had trouble with trust in the Lord, which is right here, fear God, that's trust. And I had trouble with pride. Because I would lean on my own ability. That's why I didn't want to become a Christian. I thought I could fix it myself. I didn't need God. Why do I need God? I can fix it on my own. I've been fixing my life since I was 16. Why do I need God? See, that's pride talking. That's flesh talking. But I'm being honest, okay? That's why I love this verse here. That's probably why I'm talking on it so much. Because today's Friday, and today Friday is a summary of this week of preaching on fire. And I hope you get our Sunday prayer letter because that letter is important and the scriptures are in there. And I hope you study the scriptures for this week on fire because tomorrow I'm going to write a new letter with new scriptures. So if you're not a part of our Sunday prayer letter, why? You know, we have 800 subscribers now. We hit 800 on Wednesday night. And uh, we're pushing around 7,000 views every month, 7,000 views on our channel. And so I say this often, why aren't you a part of our Sunday prayer letter? And so far, as I mentioned before, 32 people, that's it, 32 people out of 7,000 views have been elected to be a part of our Sunday prayer letter. Why? Why is that? I think it's very telling in the body of Christ because these people are watching me, they're a part of my ministry, a part of the Lord's ministry, but they're not a part physically. They just take from our ministry, but they don't deliver. And you know, they don't give to the ministry. I'm not talking about everybody. Please don't hear me out. I'm not talking to everybody. But the vast majority, they take, but they don't give. They take, 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 take. We talked in success motivation. You can be a taker or you can be a giver. Takers will always go broke. 
the givers will always succeed. You can be a saver, you can be a spender. We used to talk all about that stuff. I also did some financial planning. I worked for, uh, anyway, there's another story there. I worked at four, I was a stockbroker four times. I also sold life insurance four different times. I've done a lot of things, a lot of things. So in being a stockbroker and uh, in that field, you have to learn to counsel people, talk to people, because you become a registered rep. And that's what we did, you know, that's what I did. And those are the times that I got out of the truck, because through the 40 years of trucking, I would take off for three or four or five, six months, and I would do some sort of a job. And I'm a very good salesman, so I would sell myself on being a stockbroker, and I would last three to six months, and I'd give up because I couldn't do it. <laughs> but uh, then I'd go back to trucking, because I had a family, man. <clears throat> I had a family. And uh, anyways. So what happened in 94, the Lord decided to step in. And when I talk about you have to humble yourself, if you don't humble yourself, God's going to humble you. That's not just words. I'm not just saying that. I lived it. So up to 1994, I couldn't deal with my pride. I just couldn't seem to get rid of it. As much as I tried, I just couldn't seem to lay it down. I prided myself in my preaching and my ministry. I prided myself in how many tens of thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of gospel tracts I've placed. I prided myself in my sermons. I prided myself on all the Bible that I've studied. I, I was prideful in the ministry too. And that's why my ministry was so flat for so many, many years. Just being honest, being honest, man. A lot of people aren't honest with themselves. And if they're not honest with themselves, they're not gonna be honest with you. You gotta be honest. And sometimes you have to open your heart on camera. I've done this many, many times over the years, sharing some of the struggles that I've had. And I've had a lot of people say, man, that really helped me, John. I didn't realize that about you, or that, or that, whatever they say, you know. But when you tell your story, you tell your struggles that you've gone through. Now, these struggles, I've over overcome them all. I'm, I'm done with all the, the pride. That's been gone a long time. But in 94, the Lord stepped into my life in a big, big way. And actually, it probably was the other way. I think maybe God stepped back a foot or two. That's what it probably feels like. And when he stepped back a foot or two, or whatever, however that works, it's like Satan came in to our family and literally destroyed our family in September of 1994, Labor Day weekend. September 4th, September 4th, 1994, my entire world was probably about, I don't know, I'm gonna say probably about one o'clock in the afternoon, two o'clock in the afternoon. I was home that day off, I was home that day. Nancy and the kids were at grandma's house. I'd just come in that morning, it was a Tuesday, came in on that Tuesday, and uh, I was, in the garage, we had a big, beautiful two-car garage with a workshop and two and a half car garage and half the garage was a, a workshop. And uh, had the garage door open, it was a beautiful day, September in Reading. And a uh, police officer, I'll say this. So two police cars drove up to my house, one drove into the driveway, and then another one parked in front. As soon as that happened, guess what? Now, I'm very, very visible in my neighborhood. When I talk about going and telling your neighbors, that's what I did. I've told all my neighbors about Christ. I had a big old cross, 30-foot cross in my front yard, <laughs> Hard, higher than the house was, probably 25 foot, could have been 30 feet, 10 to 15 feet above the roof line. And I would light it up at night sometimes, not every night, but I'd light it up at night sometimes. And uh, so they both got out of the car and they both took the safety strap off their sidearm, their pistol on their sidearm. And I'm looking at them and I'm in the garage looking, you know, because the garage door is open. And uh, he waited, the one that drove in the driveway waited for a moment until the one in the, on the street got towards him and they both walked into the garage with the hands, with their hand on their pistol, on their sidearm. And I remember seeing him take the leather strap off the trigger, the 
whatever that is there. And they had their hand on their, one had some paper in his hand. And I said, good morning, how you guys doing? And he said, are you Robert Shuck? Or whatever they said, very, very business-like. And uh, I said, yes, I am. And uh, so they served me with divorce papers. And they served me with a an eviction notice and they served me with a restraining order. Yeah. And they said, you're required by law to leave this moment. And I said, all right. And uh, they gave me all the paperwork. And uh, I said, I drive for Youngman Trucking and I go back out on Thursday and all my trucking gear is in my bedroom. And I need that trucking gear to be able to go do my job. And I said, okay, we'll go in with you and get only what you need, nothing else, but what you need for your work. So those two police officers walked in with me and we walked all the way through the kitchen, through the hallway, to the back of the house, into our master bedroom. And I got all my gear together. They stood right beside me, watching me. And I got all my gear together, my bag and all my trucking material, all my trucking stuff. Change of clothes for my truck. I always brought a change of clothes with me. And they escorted me out, the, out of the house. And they had me lock, they checked both doors, make sure they were locked. And they had me give them the keys. I could not have the key to the house. And uh, I had my boss's pickup because I was hauling some uh, backyard debris that I was cleaning the backyard up. And so I borrowed my boss's pickup to uh, haul the stuff away. And, uh, and so I couldn't leave my boss's truck there. So I left both of our cars there and I got into my boss's pickup. And by that time, it was probably, you know, three o'clock and I went into town in the pickup, my boss's pickup, left my two cars there, and uh, went into a restaurant, I ordered a cup of coffee, and I was shaking, and my whole world was coming crashing down around me, my entire world. And uh, I read every word on those legal documents, and I couldn't believe what I was reading. I thought, is this mine? Nancy had wrote up who he, she thought I was, and I thought I was reading some story about somebody I never knew before. I didn't recognize anything in there, except maybe a phrase here, a phrase there, but, but most of it, I didn't even recognize who it was. And uh, on the top sheet of these legal documents, I forget what they're, exactly what they're called, there was a sheet of paper, and on the top of the sheet of paper was large, probably about an inch high, with two asterisks on both sides in block, red uh, marker that said, throw out, throw out. Do underlines and big asterisk marks, throw out. That was their order for me, to throw me out. That's... And when I read what Nancy had written, because she's a journalist and she knows how to write really well, she was able to condense my whole entire life from childhood all the way to uh, 94, however, I was 40 years old. She was able to condense all my entire life and everything she condensed was of all the sin that I had committed. All the sin, that's what she highlighted, every sin that she remembered, you know, we're husband and wife. So we've been married 16 years and uh, going on 17. And she knew all my, she knew everything about me. There was nothing hidden from her. I'm an open book. I had no open, no, no skeleton in the closet. And when I read those several pages of every sin that I'd committed, the way she wrote it in such dramatic, concentrated, wording that no wonder I said to myself no wonder the judge wrote on the top throw out because he tore that off real quick he didn't want me to see it but I saw it he, would, he didn't want me to see that and you know the police officers were nice they were very cordial and they were uh, uh, polite but they were very very business and uh, 
The second officer never took his hand off his pistol. The one who was reading me, you know, the paper and stuff, he had to take his hands off the pistol. But both of their safety straps were off their pistols to pull out immediately. And as I was sitting in the coffee shop reading that, I said, no wonder they acted the way they acted. No wonder that was at the top of it. So that's called being accuser of the brethren. That's called Satan knows everything that you've ever done. And he's never going to let you forget it. And that started a five-year process of God humbling me to really nothing, to, to a doormat, to nobody, to nothing. I'm lower than the dirt. I'm lower than anything. And after those five years, it's probably maybe four years, 96, 7, 8, 99, something like that. Could have been 2000. I think the end of this turmoil of making me humble is when the doctor gave me 90 days to live. I had, uh, towards the end of this time of God humbling me, I had, a, I had got prostate cancer, and I got testicle cancer, and I got colon cancer, and on top of that, I had, right on top of my cheek on this side here, I had developed a melanoma cancer. And I was in a, uh, also had a very severe infection that was running through all my organs. I had dropped down to about 115, 16 pounds. And the doctor said, I'll give you 90 days if you don't have surgery. And I went back to my, my condo that I had. I was out in the mission field. I'd give up. I took a few years off from trucking. And uh, during around 2000 or so, I took a few years off from trucking and went out in the mission field for four years. And uh, so I went back to the condo where the Lord put me. And I went home to die. I went home to die because I wasn't going to go to the hospital. I gave up. I said, I'm done, Lord. I've given everything that I know. I don't know what else I can do to serve you. I don't know. I don't know. And so if you want to bring me home early, I'm ready, Lord. Bring me home early. I'm ready. And that lasted for several months. I can't remember the exact dates, but several months. I didn't die, obviously. But I had lowered myself to, I, I just, I, I had nothing left, nothing left. I lost everything. God wasn't using me in the ministry anymore. He let the ministry go for about a year. I couldn't even serve the Lord anymore. I was also teaching school. I couldn't teach anymore. I couldn't preach anymore. Couldn't minister anymore. Um, I gave up my job. And uh, basically, uh, I was ready to die. I got my house ready to go. I got everything ready to go to die. And uh, this is about 2000-ish, something like that. I can't remember exactly, but it's something like that. I've not, I, there, I can go back to the doctors and get the exact dates, but I've never written any of this stuff down. So I don't remember. I don't talk about it that much. I don't know why I'm talking about it now, but this verse has just really got me talking. And um, so I was in the bathroom one, one day, one morning, one afternoon, whatever, and uh, sitting on the toilet. And uh, suddenly I was talking to God and I saw a, in my spirit, with my spiritual eyes, I saw a looked like a kite string, a string, a white kite string, hanging out the bottom of me. Uh, you know, the, the, the anus. You know, probably a, the string looked about six inches long, hanging out the bottom of me. I saw it in my spirit. 
Physically, it wasn't there, but in the spirit. And I said, what is that? In my spirit, I said, well, what is that? And the Lord said, grab it. And so I, in the spirit, I grabbed it. And he said, now pull. And I started pulling. And I just started pulling and pulling and pulling and just keep, said, keep pulling. And as I was pulling it, it piled up on the floor in front of me. It looked like a kite string, like a string that you fly a kite with. That's what it looked like to me. And it just kept piling up on the floor, like a big old pile of string at my feet. And I kept pulling and falling. And all of a sudden, it came to a stop. I mean, it just like it wouldn't pull them. It was like it was stuck. I said, what do you want me to do, Lord? He said, yank it out. And I just said, yeah. And I just yanked with all my heart. With everything I had, I yanked it as hard as I could. And it fell out of my hands and fell to the floor. And in the next 36 hours, I was completely and totally healed of the infection, the colon cancer, testicle cancer, and the prostate cancer. And the melanoma completely disappeared in 36 hours. I went back to all the doctors, and the one doctor who really was startled the most was my eye doctor person who was going to do the surgery. And uh, they looked in here, they said, we can see that there were roots all throughout my cheek, but they were no longer there. There was no evidence at all of any cancer at all inside of my, under my eye here. And of course, that's all gone now. It's all been healed up totally. But it, it looked to them, the doctors, it looked like uh, canals that the roots used to travel through. But there's no more root, there's no more root system of the, that's how he described it to me. And then I went back to the doctor who gave me my prostate exam and uh, said, man, well, I don't know what happened. So they noted in their, the doctors noted, it says uh, it was a uh, uh, unexplainable miracle, unexplainable phenomenon, and uh, un, 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 unknown to us or something like that, was then documented in their files. And I went back to the doctor who checked my colon again. He said, it's perfect. There's not one sign of any cancer whatsoever in your colon. And, uh, and the testicle was completely healed. It had swollen up. One of my testicles had swollen up the size of a large, oversized avocado. And uh, I was in bad shape. And uh, within about four or five months after that, that was shortly after, right after that is when the Lord started having me write my prayers out. And I talk about that in class. That's when that one morning when the Lord had me write my prayers out. Now, all this is kind of cloudy to me. I don't have an exact dates or a lot of them are kind of, all this story is kind of jumbled up, but these are bits and pieces of my story. And uh, the Lord put me, sent me back home off the mission field, sent me back home. Home was Redding, California. And he put me back with Youngman Trucking. I've been there for 27 years. And uh, uh, put me back in the truck. And uh, I started preaching again. And people said, John's not the same person. And I've not been the same since then. So from 94 to about 99 or 2000, God humbled me. And I've been humble ever since. That's 24 years ago, 25 years of being humble. And that's how I've lived. And that's why God is still using me today. And that's why I'll never be a prideful man. Because I know what it feels like to be a prideful man. And I see pride in a lot of people. And I hear it in their tone of their voice. I hear it. Because I know exactly what it sounds like. I know what it looks like. And I know the results of pride. And no matter what I say to people, they just refuse to hear it. Why they refuse to hear it is because of their pride. Pride does not allow them to hear the truth. And I guess maybe that's why I couldn't hear the truth, because of the pride I had. 
but I've been fully, completely healed for 25 years. I've had several, I check up every single year. I check everything out, make sure everything, prostate, colon, uh, not every year with a colon, but uh, everything else, eyes, everything, all checked. Everything is still in great working order, very healthy. And so that's why I also come against preachers who say there's no such thing as healing today. That is an absolute bold-faced lie in your face. That is a word coming from a pastor who is being moved by Satan. When that preacher, that pastor, that evangelist, whoever they are, they say there's no such thing as healing today, that is a lie from the father of lies. Because I am fully, completely healed. And I have other healings I can testify to. But this is a testimony of me not being able to humble myself because the Bible says, humble yourself. I couldn't do it. I tried. And then God stepped in or stepped back, however, he, but however it happened, and that place destroyed everything. Because for after the marriage broke up, I had to step down from ministry for two and a half years. I could not minister at all. And then God reinstated me so I could minister some more after that. I tell you, it's been a long road to hope. Long road I've traveled. And I feel like I'm on the edge of crying right now because I feel like I want to fall down and begin crying at the feet of Jesus. Because if it wasn't for Jesus in my life, I would be dead. I would be dead. I would have died at 40 to 45 years old. I would have died early in life if it wasn't for Jesus. But because of Jesus, I'll be 71 here in a few more months. How about that? How about that? And I'm a street preacher. Retired, long-haul trucker, three million miles. So you can take this verse and just read it and think that you got it all together. Or you can stop and listen to me and say, well, maybe I don't have it all together. Because in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4, it says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life and that's why I can stand here today because I have the riches and the honor and the life but they didn't come from this world and no person but God Almighty I am rich in Christ I have honor in Christ and I have life in Christ and that's just not words that I'm saying that's my life in Christ let's pray Lord I thank you that you've allowed me to give one more more of my testimony. I just seem like I have a full life, a big life, and there's a lot of things in my life that I, just my life, and it is what it is. And if it hurts people, so what? If it helps people, oh well. Whatever it does, Lord, it's what I, what you wanted me to do on this night, this day. I was, you know, I had already prepared, Lord, to preach out of several verses, but you wanted me to tell this story, and so. I told it, and I hope I said it all right, and I hope I, my voice, my, my testimony honors you, Lord, and I hope my testimony overcomes Satan, because I don't love my life to the end. I live in Revelation 12, 11. Those aren't just simple little nice words to say occasionally. I live it. I live it every day, and you know I live it, and I know I live it, and I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to come out here to Longmont in your holy name, Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, I'm going to let you go. Have a great day. I'm going to lift my banner now. Uh, I love you very much. Take care. All right, good afternoon, folks. This is uh, Preacher John. We're at their second location here in Longmont. This is US 287 and uh, Colorado 119. So right behind me, right over my shoulder here, uh, all these cars... Uh, they're coming off the Interstate 25, uh, up the road here a few miles. And this is kind of like a gate coming into the city. And then on my sh left shoulder there, that's downtown Longmont where I was earlier at US 287, which is uh, Main Street and uh, Fifth Avenue. So I was up there till two o'clock this afternoon and uh, Lord gave me a ride down here. Lord said to stay to two o'clock. He said, stay to two o'clock. And so I stayed to two o'clock and uh, somebody showed up and was talking to me and offered me a ride to come down here. So 
it was instead of a 30, 35 minute walk, it was a two minute ride in a car. It was actually fantastic. It was just from one place, I was like transported to another location. I feel like Philip, <laughs> who was transported to Azortis, and I was transported to uh, South, Bowl, South Longmont here. So anyways, uh, I'll be here for another hour or two hours, and I'll catch the bus right over there, about a half a block is the bus that goes back to Boulder. And uh, praise God, a lot of cars out here, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars, lots and lots of people, and uh, we're flying the banner for Jesus Christ out here on the city of Longmont, Colorado. Preacher John, signing off. Bye-bye.